I um, just want to open by saying a very quick thank you to Ricky Bidet and the, and the team for so generously uh, accommodating the Prime Minister and uh, Boris Johnson, who I think just about behaved himself yesterday. We had no idea what Boris was going to say, um, but I think we, we escaped pretty much unscathed. Um, the, the, the PM and Boris, for those of you who are here yesterday, were talking about Tech City, the, uh, the cluster in East London that we've been trying to uh, support and get behind over the past couple of years. And I, I just thought it'd be helpful to, to just very quickly run through uh, the sort of approach that we've, we've taken on Tech City, which is also informing our approach to supporting clusters around the UK. And I think, I think, I hope, there are some relevant insights for those of you who are thinking about how government should interplay with emergent, organic, bottom-up clusters around the world, in your, in your cities. And um, the, the, the thing we've tried to do with, with Tech City is uh, to, to really understand, start by understanding what the character of the area of London is, and to go with the grain of that character, not to try and hubristically superimpose our own vision from above. And there are a few places in London that I think are really evocative of a certain kind of character. Um, and you'll see these, I hope, reflected in our policies and our activities to support tech city specifically. Now this uh, little patch of town uh, should be very familiar to some of you. It, uh, Richard Rogers lives sort of right, right around there. Um, this, is, this is Royal Avenue in Chelsea. And Royal Avenue uh, and this, this bit of of, of town is interesting, I think, because it's a fragment of what London might have looked like had Christopher Wren's master plan for London after the Great Fire in 1666 come to pass. And as Richard so um, so brilliantly points out, the reason that uh, you know this 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 little patch of, of of ground doesn't doesn't go very far is that right behind where this sort of photo is taken is the King's Road in Chelsea. And while the boulevards were being planned and some of them were even starting to be built like this, the merchants and shopkeepers and uh, homeowners simply rebuilt their streets on the old lines. Sure, they used brick and they might have widened the streets a little, but fundamentally, everything pretty much stayed the same. And I, I adore that kind of effervescent, bottom-up um, attitude of London. And it's really one that we've tried to embrace with Tech City, and you see it. You see the, the, the this sort of spirit, I think, here too, um, because you know, thinking about what bottom-up means in the 21st century, I think it has a lot to do with data. And one of the activities that we're really championing, and you're going to see a lot over the next couple of years in Tech City, is making this part of London where we are now a global locus for smart city innovation. And uh, London has a fantastic pedigree for this. So there's the Royal Avenue and the sort of example of how top-down plans uh, fall foul of bottom-up um, uh, entrepreneurship. This, this place is, um, is Soho. And uh, it, was, it was on this, in this spot in Soho that, um, Sir John, uh, that John Snow, a physician, a doctor, started doing experiments looking at the cause of a cholera outbreak in London. And until this point, cholera, there were many theories about cholera. Was it caused by bad vapors, by, by air, you know? And um, John Snow decided to kind of, you know, put the theories to one side and collect data on the location of uh, where people were living uh, who, who contracted cholera and what their activities were. This is the first example, one of the very first examples of using spatial analysis of mapping to inform policy making. John Snow discovered, realized that this pump, uh, or a pump on this site, was the epicenter of the cholera outbreak. And he was able to petition the city authorities, this sort of interplay between citizen activism and, and city agency. He was able to, able to uh, petition for this pump to be closed down. And uh, changed the face of modern medicine, arg arguably. Changed the way we think about statistical analysis, spatial analysis, and so on. And that, hap that happened right here in London. And I think that's why 
we've placed such an emphasis, that, that, that pedigree, that history, on creating these kinds of institutions, an open data institute, which is uh, up and running right now in Shoreditch, this Intel Collaborative Research Institute, which is opening next year. And we've brought UCL and Imperial College London together as well um, to, to create a smart cities network in Shoreditch, in Old Street. And, you know, asking, uh, you know, I think this is an important thing for government to do, to ask the question constantly, you know, where is it that innovation might go? But critically, how does that innovation relate to and, and is formed by the character of the city itself? And uh, as I say, I think this, this pedigree around data and this pedigree around bottom-up innovation, I think helps explain why we place such emphasis there. And if we were thinking about clusters elsewhere in, in the country, we'd be also asking ourselves the question, what does the history of these cities say about the future potential direction of innovation? This is another place in London that I think says a lot about the, the, uh, the character of, uh, of this city and is also informing our policies going forward. This is um, Southampton Row. It's, it's right by Russell Square in, uh, in central London. And uh, in 1933, on the 12th of September 1933, uh, a young man, a, a physicist, um, uh, with the surname of uh, Zillard, was crossing the street. And this, this physicist it was a very special and interesting guy. He'd come to the UK. Uh, he'd studied under Max Planck and Albert Einstein. And the reason he was in the UK was that he was Jewish and had fled persecution. And as he was crossing the street, at this, you know, pretty much this point, an epiphany hit him. And it was an epiphany about the, uh, the way in which a nuclear chain reaction could take place. And it was that epiphany um, and, and how much uh, plutonium and uranium would be needed to, to drive the reaction that led directly to the creation of the atomic bomb, changed the direction of the 20th century. Um, he, he himself was a pacifist, was mortally distressed by where his insight had led. But you know, this, this spot always makes me think about the incredible way in which London has been open to ideas and people wherever in the world they come from. And again, with Tech City, we've really tried to be true to that, not only by bringing global companies, the Googles and Microsofts and Intels to, to East London, but, but more broadly, you know, when we launched Tech City two years ago, in the very speech that the Prime Minister uh, used to, to kick off the initiative, we announced entrepreneur visas so that the best entrepreneurs around the world can come to the UK as easily as possible. And uh, uh, over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be launching a global business plan competition centered on Tech City to bring the best business school graduates to East London. And so again, thinking about the character, thinking about the histories informing our policies for the present and the future. And the, 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 the final place I just want to flag up is, uh, is in East London. And uh, again, I think says a lot about the character of this city and where our policy agenda should go for Tech City specifically, also arguably for London as a whole. This is, um, this is Cable Street in Stepney. And in 1936, a march of fascists led by Oswald Mosley was planning to uh, head down this street. In fact, was, was, was heading uh, on its way down this street. And 100,000 people from London rose up to block their path. Men, women, children, uh, all fought in the streets to prevent the fascists passing down this street. Women were throwing chamber pots out of, out of windows. Men were using uh, table legs and candlesticks to, to fight, fight off the fascists. And um, the fascists ultimately couldn't get through. The, uh, the protesters' mantra was, they shall not pass. And they didn't. These, these fascists did not pass. They were dispersed. They had to go to Hyde Park and, and uh, uh, sort of, you know, collect their wits there. And this, to me, I think is an amazing demonstration and reminder of the solidarity of London. And whatever the extremes and differences in this city, and there are differences within Tech City and outside of Tech City and so on, uh, there's a sense of community that it's important that we embrace and build on. Um, and one of the things that we've, we're very proud of doing with this Tech City initiative in, in East London to support this tech cluster is, uh, is launch Tech City apprenticeships. We've launched uh, a program now of 500 apprenticeships 
Google, Facebook, dozens and dozens of tech city companies all stepping up to the plate to provide apprenticeships for unemployed young people from the area. And if it wasn't for our sense of the history of this city and the character of the city, we wouldn't be organizing and coming up with policies like that. And so I would, I would say to, to any of you thinking about clusters, and certainly I hope we remember this in the, the weeks and months going forward, look to the past, look to the places in our cities that tell us something about the character of the places we live and can inform our policy agenda going forward. Um, the risk for us, I think, is that we lose sight of that. And hopefully with an eye on these kind of places and plenty more, we'll, we'll uh, keep doing the right thing by Tech City and by London in the years ahead. Thank you.